Forward through the ages in unbroken line, faithful spirits have gathered here to do good ministry, building on the legacy of our ancestors in ministry and in this faith, feeling their presence and grateful for their support, listening to their call to fulfill their hopes and grow their vision. We worship today in celebration of the ministry present here today and in particular, the ministry of Reverend T.J. Fitzgerald. We worship in gratitude for the gifts he brings to this free faith, and we affirm the powerful ministry he brings to this congregation and to our world. We worship with minds and hearts open to the spirit of love that moves within and among us in this place. As we sing and pray, celebrate and give thanks for this day, let us experience a love so powerful so alive, so vibrant, that it can't help but spill out into all of our lives, into our service to Unitarian Universalism, and into our world. As we come together today to affirm the ministry of Reverend TJ, let us join together in saying the affirmation of this church, our covenant of faithful promises to one another, followed by our sung doxology, both of which are printed in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of our church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. Welcome all to this special service of affirmation. We are so glad that you are here. We welcome those of you who are online with us as well around the country and around the world. We also welcome the parents of TJ who are here in the second row. <laughs> the flowers were given by TJ for you, these beautiful flowers. And we're glad that you've traveled to be with us today. We're happy to include our uh, new friend, a friend, old friend of TJ's, Reverend Jeremy Williams, who's a, a professor of New Testament at Bright Divinity School at Texas Christian University. We welcome you to this church today. And much thanks goes to the search committee who uh, found TJ and helped us get to an affirmation. They are here, and where else are they? They're working. <laughs> no, they're, they'll be at the reception, but we are so glad for them. We don't have a lot of announcements. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> the offerings at services like this are typically given to special causes, and today, TJ has chosen the recipient for this collection. The collection will go to the Truth Pregnancy Resource Center, and a mission or ministry of this church that is in formation. It is our hopes is that it will be open early in the new year to do all options counseling for people who are pregnant. That means they will be counseled following their wishes if they want to pursue adoption or pursue birth or pursue abortion, and those, uh, are, that's what this church will be meeting the people of uh, Dallas with, giving them free, honest, truthful sonograms if they wish, and uh, offering them avenues to address their pregnancy. So the Truth Pregnancy Resource Center is the recipient 
of the offering. If you write a check, you can just write TPRC in the memo line. If anyone writes checks anymore, I, I don't know. Or you can place something in the plate as they come around. Uh, you can also go to our website and do a drop down uh, to TPRC under our Repro Dignity uh, tab on get in the Giving tab. That's it. The offering will be given and received. Good evening or afternoon, whichever it is. I'm so honored to be here. And if you wouldn't mind, could you join me in a brief word of prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So, I am really honored to be here for this very special occasion. It's great to be here to affirm the partnership between First Unitarian and Rev TJ. <laughs> oh yeah, y'all can give it up for Rev TJ. Oh, he must be doing some good work. Awesome. Well, I know you all love him, but I've known him for over a decade. Uh, and this semester actually marks 10 years. It's 10 years since our first semester at Yale Divinity School. Whew. Where'd the time go? During that semester, Reverend TJ and I were literally classmates for the introduction to pastoral care class. We learned a number of things in that class that have certainly yielded fruit in my ministry. And there was one particular concept that I frequently return to. It is the notion of the future story. Although the term may or may not have been coined by a pastoral care scholar and psychologist Howard Stone, he employs it in his work. One of the central tenets of this concept in pastoral care is that when one experiences loss, whether the loss of a loved one or of an opportunity or of a career, part of what the person grieves goes beyond the person or the thing lost. The person also grieves the loss of the future that they had previously imagined with that person, with that life path, or that object. Although the story had not yet happened, it is still real in that it was supposed to be the sequel to what is happening now. It's the trips that we were going to take. It's the life we were going to live after retirement. It's the home that we were going to buy. It's the fair family heirloom that I was going to pass down to the next generation. But life has a way of lifing. <laughs> With life's unpredictability and constant flux, our future stories could not be anything other than fantasy or passing dreams. But what's wrong with dreaming? In Mark Twain's short novel, The Mysterious Stranger, the protagonist states, that all of reality is a dream. And if that's the case, why not dream other dreams, better dreams? For those who are grieving and trudging through disappointment, it could seem that an invitation to dream is insensitive or at least ill-timed. However, it is in nightmarish circumstances that beautiful dreams can shine even more brilliantly. Jonas Salek, the inventor of the polio vaccine, once stated that I have had dreams and I have had nightmares, but I overcame my nightmares by the power of my dreams. From this perspective, the minister of care has a task to walk with people who have the shards of shattered future stories, and they are to help them to piece them together into a dreamy mosaic. The minister of care is also a writing coach. 
not necessarily the type who helps students to turn messy drafts into organized prose, but the type who helps people to take their own hands and put in their own hands the pen that writes their own story. Some of you have already experienced this type of coaching as Reverend TJ has given you tips for rewriting your own future stories. This position to which Reverend TJ has been called is not only the minister of community care, but it's also of community engagement. With this in mind, the minister of community engagement is also a writing coach. But here, the work is not to rewrite future stories that no longer exist due to calamity, but it's to write futures that are actively being erased. That work is a tall order and certainly a calling, one that can uproot a person from the beaches of Honolulu <laughs> to the weeks of 100 degree plus weather in Dallas. And if you would indulge me as a Bible scholar to briefly mention a story from the New Testament book, Acts of the Apostles, which my research is on, there's a story of a protagonist receiving a call from a man of Macedonia in modern day Greece. When the protagonists get to Macedonia, they don't find a man. They find women to help complete their future stories. Although probably not as visual as Acts portrays this scene, but in a real way nonetheless, Reverend TJ saw state and local leaders erasing the stories of women and girls having autonomy over their own bodies. And he felt called to come here and demand that they be given back their pens to write their own stories. <laughs> Empowering people to write their own stories is important work especially in these times, especially for those who are being attacked by almost every branch of government, including the Supreme Court. In our times that witness so many injustices like patriarchal militancy, racism's intensity, economic inequality, environmental insensitivity, educational inequity, criminalization's intentionality, and healthcare's inaccessibility. In times like these, it is important to have someone like Reverend TJ to remind people that they can still write their own stories. Even when the burden of medical debt chains people's pens down, they still have a story. And those shackles can be destroyed so that their story is no longer about how their healing imprisoned them, but how the ministry of places like First Unitarian helped to set them free. Similarly, for those who have been imprisoned in the most inhumane injustice system on the planet, they too still have a story to tell and a future to write. Although I personally am a prison abolitionist, I also recognize that the humans confined in cages have spiritual needs that must be met until all these jails are empty. It's the type of chaplain work that Reverend TJ provides that reminds us that those who are incarcerated are humans with parents and families and ultimately are a part of our shared human family. With this important work that must be done, it's good that Reverend TJ had examples of this professional religious work in his aunt and cousin. It is also good that he went to that concert at All Souls in New York City and began writing a future story that got him on this path. It is good that he spent the formative years at the Riverside Church and that he learned skills at the First Unitarian Church of Portland. It's good that he answered the call to continue writing that story at the First Unitarian Church of Honolulu. And it's even better that he has answered the call to partner with this congregation in writing a future story. A story that in some ways neither of you knew would be written a decade ago. But a story that not only is good now, but is necessary. It is necessary for this type of ministry to exist in these times because God's far purpose in one living whole demands that we move one together to the shining goal. 
forward through the ages in unbroken line, move the faithful spirits at the call divine. So as you write this future together, may you lean into each other because the world needs your witness. And because as Reverend TJ and I learned in a song in divinity school, God has work for us to do. Till all the jails are empty and all the bellies filled, till no one hurts or steals or lies and no more blood is spilled, God has work for us to do. Till age and race and gender no longer separate, till pulpit, press, and politics are free of greed and hate, God has work for us to do. Through tending to creation, to water, land, and air, through what we do and what we don't, to nourish and repair, God has work for us to do. Through seeking the protection of creatures great and small, through binding up the web of life that animates us all, God has work for us to do. By sitting at a bedside to hold pale trembling hands, by speaking for the powerless, against unjust demands, by praying through our doing and singing though we fear, by trusting that the seed we sow will bring God's harvest near. God has work for us to do. So do the work and forge new future stories together. Amen. Good afternoon. I'm Angie Sifferman, and I have the honor of serving as the president of our congregation. In our free churches, the relationships we are about to recognize rest between a people of a church and the minister whom they serve. On March 1st, 2023, Reverend TJ was hired to serve this congregation as Minister of Community Care and Engagement. I ask those of you now who are members of this church to stand and say these words with me. We acknowledge your ministry among us today. We would have you dwell among us, preach the truth as you find it, in freedom and in love, rebuking evil and maintaining righteousness, ministering to us in our joys and in our sorrows, setting forth no less by your example than by your precept, the life of faith. May our work together be joyous, sustained by the one who is the source of all ministry. We, the members of First Unitarian Church of Dallas, do hereby affirm your ministry here and offer you our encouragement and assistance as you minister among us. Prayerfully, Gratefully, and with the deepest gratitude and humility, I accept your affirmation of service here at First Unitarian Church of Dallas. I pray with the help of my family, whose strength and my ancestors I call upon now to root me in this community, that my ministry will flourish alongside your own that it might bless each of you, bless this town, bless this state, and bless the world that we know, that we might hold it together in liberty, find it in greater justice, but mostly bless it with the great, with the powerful, and the divine love that we show one another every day. I accept your offer I accept your love, and in return, I say with my deepest gratitude, thank you.
TJ, you got to come on up here for this charge. Today we have already heard a lot to ponder, my friends. Mm -hmm. It's my job now to give you a charge to ministry here. The fact is that you are already so damn good at it, I'm hard pressed to say much. <laughs> but tradition holds us on this stage this afternoon for a reason, and that is to pass through the ministry some sense of responsibility a calling and joy in the work we do together. So we have already started that, and you have made my life and the life of this church better. But I might give you some reminders just to mark this day for us and for you and for this church. The charge, when I was installed as senior minister from John Burens, who had been the senior minister here years ago, was what he called an electrical charge. <laughs> he squeezed me pretty hard, so come on in. <laughs> <laughs> electrical. <laughs> and with that electrical charge is the urging to continue to thrive in ministry among us, to make us better, to preach with joy, to tell the truth, to keep us organized, and to do it with your spirit that is so thoughtful and happy and hopeful. The charge is to remember this. We who wear robes are called to the ministry. What God calls us to be and to do is not a question that is once posed and answered and can be put away, never raised again. It is a persistent thing to those of us who have keys to this building and aim to serve these people and speak from this pulpit a persistent thing that we must do to raise the question to what are you called? There will be days when you dream of something easier to do or have fantasies about more cooperative congregants. <laughs> there will be time when the songs of the sirens call from the shores to tell you how much you are needed and will tempt you to veer off course there will be moments when you sit alone in this sanctuary in the dark like I have many, many times, wondering if I have any faith left or believe in anything or have anything more to give. There will be those times. And I have found that the only thing that keeps me going besides the love of this loving congregation and a little support from our staff and ministerial colleagues, the only thing that will keep you going is knowing you are called to serve the highest purpose you can compose of in your heart and mind. And nothing else that might motivate you matters much because if you get right with that holy conversation, everything else falls in place. So that's the first thing, and the rest of the encouragement is to care for yourself in this ministry because I have seen you in this year giving your all, which I love about you, but I also worry that you will give too much. <laughs> I sense that you have something in you that I would call the enticement of the myth of competence. <laughs> <laughs> The expectation to perform and get results that can turn into a source of anxiety for you. And if it, your self-worth is tied up in external definitions and assurances of being competent, that is going to be a tough road ahead. Do you hear me? I hear you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you are competent, and you don't need to prove it to us, and we don't need to assure you of it. Confessing incompetence from time to time, is a gift you can give yourself and us. <laughs> and adopting a functional theology of grace is another thing. I sense you already have this as a gift. Making personal excellence, not competence, your standard will help. Accepting failure as progress and defining your leadership as meeting the needs of the church with the appropriate means and doing it not at the expense of your own health or well-being is the goal. Am I right? Amen. Robert Rabel gave a speech in 1975. Robert Rabel, the minister of this church for, four, for 22 years, from 1942 to 64, 
He gave a speech in 1975 to the Ministers Association on the occasion of his 50th anniversary in ministry, in which he said that if he had to do it all over again, he would have climbed more mountains and swam in more rivers and gone to more dances and not made such good grades. <laughs> he also said in that speech that his greatest accomplishment was being able to say, I survived. Given all that we have to do under expectations that sometimes sound like a list of the impossible, speaking like golden-tongued angels, organizing efficiently, motivating volunteers, afflicting the comfortable, giving care to souls that may be unwilling to receive it, lifting up countercultural, prophetic visions, all while being above reproach as God's agents in the world at all times and all places. <laughs> Woo, baby. <laughs> We will always be inadequate. <laughs> the good news is that not one of us up here is called to do any of this alone. We are in this together. And success is not survival. And we know that we are going to thrive in this growing church. We will do many things that look like ministry and many things that don't look like ministry but we will do it for the church and our city and our larger community and we will do it all because we have been called to serve. And every day we will ask ourselves, to what are we called to do? And we will be good at answering that call. The answers will change and the answers will confuse us, but we will be thinking of the greater good this church, and we will answer those questions in hum with humbleness and love of this place, until which time it is ours to pass it on to others. And then we will remember that we are all temporary. And if we do that, this place is going to thrive another hundred years. Now we three have a covenant, the three ministers have a covenant, and it's two pages long, I'm not gonna read it to you. But you, me, and Beth, we have said our covenant this evening in the presence of our colleagues. In it, it says to challenge one another and to value creativity and innovation as a part of our team's success. It says to encourage each other to speak with integrity and conviction on issues that matter to the congregation. And when questions arise between us, we will ask them. And it says to remind ourselves of the enduring power of love and forgiveness in all things. We will be here for each other. Robert Rabel said another thing in that speech all those years ago. He said there were too many expectations on him. One was that he had to be a scholar and a public figure. To that he said, I just wanted to be a parish minister and to try and help people when they hurt. And he said, the problem of the ministry is our deadly familiarity with the sublime. Your charge is to live into this amazingly sublime opportunity <laughs> called by the holy to be who you are and to serve with love. May it be so and amen. A call on the search committee who has some gifts for you. And I thought they were for you. They're not for me. They're for you. Hey. I'm a hugger, sorry. All right. Um, Stephanie and I were honored to be the co-chairs of the search committee and represent you. And Find him. And we are so proud that you are a member of our family.
And the search committee, a special thank you um, to them, some of whom are still setting up for the reception. We took on the additional task of, thank you, planning the reception. Um, I said thank you to Daniel because he asked us to. And we're happy to do that. And we are confident that with TJ on our team, we will continue to live out boldly and with conviction the true meaning of our UU principles. So we have a little token of our gratitude and our commitment to each other as we go forward. You want to open it? OK. Aww. And what he's pulling out is a stole that the search committee commissioned for TJ featuring the colors of the varied landscapes of your new home, TJ. You are just delightful, and we are so happy you're here. In the spirit of gratitude for all the gifts of this day, I invite you now to join me in a time of prayer. God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming, we pray for Reverend TJ and for our church, that we may be partners in the ministry of discernment, of tending souls and inspiring leadership to the end that all shall grow in harmony with the divine. Today, as Reverend TJ joins a long line of people who have sustained this church community for many years past and for generations to come, we pray that he feels the affirmation, power, and wisdom of those who came before him. And we give thanks for the many influences in his life and the experiences he's had that have led him to this day, the learnings from which he brings to his ministry here in Dallas. We give thanks today for the minister that Reverend TJ is, a minister committed to care, to truth and justice, to love and compassion, to strong and healthy institutions, a minister who freely shares his sense of humor and his musical gifts, a minister committed to his people, to our Unitarian Universalist faith, and to the holy that moves within and among us. We look forward with hope and a spirit of possibility to all that is yet to come and the many ways that Reverend TJ's ministry will be lived out here. May this beloved congregation find its vitality and beauty reflected back in their relationship with Reverend TJ. And through this mutual empowerment, let us work together with gratitude and appreciation, courage and honesty, forgiveness and grace. Let the streams of love flow freely and grow evermore here in Dallas and beyond. Amen. A blessing from my people. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. And may the rain fall soft upon your fields until we meet again. Go in peace, practice love, blessed be, and amen.